Hello and welcome to this lecture on the digital late modernity or a global age. Now, um, this time I'm trying to record my face as well as the PowerPoint presentation. Since I do lecture without the manuscript, I think it might be easier to follow if you also see my face. And this, we, of course, we can discuss in the evaluation as well. Now I'm recording the whole screen of my computer so therefore you have to see <laughs> a little bit in the margins here as well. I hope that's gonna be okay. So today's lecture is um, going to cover uh, first short notion on the economic foundations. I know that Sylvain will um, talk more about this in his lecture. I just want to mention because I think it can be good to have in the background. Basically, this is just a summary of the uh, chapter two in, in Miller's book. Then I go in and talk a little bit shortly about modernity and late modernity, for those of you who don't really grasp these concepts. Uh, and then I come into a concept that I've been uh, working with a lot, digital late modernity. And that's why I put my article from 2011 in the readings for, um, um, Thursday's uh, lecture. Now, I've, it's mostly the section on digital late modernity, not so much on citizenship and expressive rationality uh, that I have included this. It's mostly this that I, I think is important. And features of this digital late modernity that I think it's uh, particularly important in order to grasp our society and ourselves in it. Um, namely network individualism and the culture of the database. Now, lately I've been starting to question this um, concept of the um, late modernity uh, or modernity in general. And to go ahead, together with Oriol, my partner, um, we have written this essay where we suggest that we actually leave this idea of uh, a late modernity or digital late modernity behind instead of what we call a global age. Now this is under review, it's not published yet. It's an essay, it's a short essay, it's, um, so it's an essay style, it's not a scholarly article in that sense. And I hope to discuss this with you because I think it's interesting to hear what you think and to develop my research in dialogue with you. So let's start. So the economics foundations is shortly just uh, summarizing what Miller says. Um, so he um, uh, claims that, uh, well, his starting point here is that innovations in general is taking place in economic down periods um, in order to revive the market, etc. Now, this is, of course, a very market-oriented understanding of innovation and uh, society. Um, but his point here is that, you know, you could understand the um, in importance and the uh, uprising of ICTs, information and communication technologies, in light of this idea. Um, and then he grounds this in a, in a kind of a post-industrialist argument that what we were, what is happening, what was happening is that we went from a manufactured-based economy to a um, service-based uh, economy or an economy based on services. And this is, in, in this transition, you know, this innovation is taking place, whereas information technology is one of them. And information is becoming the important unit here in this economy. And when we um, also Thursday discuss power, uh, it's in line with, with this. I mean, who controls information, that stratification, I mean, the hierarchies in society are going to be formed in today's society as well as in the future. As well as individualism and consumerism, Miller argues are consequences from uh, uh, from you know previous eras of mass culture and mass society. But what we see in this information age is um, a more individual consumerism instead of this kind of mass consumerism. <clears throat> Furthermore, yeah. He bases his understanding of information society on this. Uh, Sylvain will discuss this further with you. And he also discusses um, information society as post-Fordist, um, in the sense that um, if we understand Fordism as mass production in factories, you know the Ford car, how it was uh, manufactured very efficiently um, by 
people being very specialized doing their things and in the end of this uh, uh, factory the, where everyone worked on their part there was a car coming out so it was mass production in fire uh, in high <laughs> mass production in factories hierarchical management and uh, kind of a disciplining of the mass of workers to do these repetitive tasks um, and this was also spur spurring uh, spurring a uh, consumer markets look, looking for this low-cost standardized good and this can then be contrasted to what we have in a post forty society which is more individual consumerism and we'll talk a lot about individualization later because it is a defining character of our society um, but mass society has failed um, or modernity if you so wish um, and we now see the um, uprisings of more flexible organization uh, and also um, a more flexible workforce is required. I mean we have these um, companies in Sweden called Manpower or this learning and companies that are hiring staff to companies um, and you could understand this in light of uh, um, uh, Miller's reasoning. Um, so with this short um, expose of that chapter, let me go into the um, core of uh, what I want to talk about, namely um, the idea of, of digital late modernity. Now what, what I'm trying to do with this concept is to, to link technological um, innovations or, or technological changes to changes in society in general. <laughs> In, in the introduction of, of Miller, um, there was this anti-deterministic um, argument that we should not, we should try to understand technology and society in tandem. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do with this concept of the digital uh, late modernity. That you can actually link it to more societal changes I mean, the rise of digital technologies such as fragmentation, individualization, reflexivity, um, as well as, um, I mean, and all these trends that have been uh, thoroughly theorized in perspectives of late modernity. So, um, what about then modernity and late um, modernity? So, where are we? Uh, so if we start then with modernity, very shortly, um, because I, I reckon many of you know this already, uh, it's based on the Enlightenment, um, this kind of um, cultural revolution taking place in the end of the 18th century in Europe, um, a Europe that was um, tired of all the religious war having gone on for centuries, and started to um, look to individuals and individual reason and um, um, instead or human reason instead of putting your faith in God that um, the man can actually think for himself and not just leave everything to God to handle and um, René Descartes, Descartes um, who f you see in the picture who framed who phrased the famous um, saying, phrase, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am. Now, what was revolutionary with, with this was the I. I think, therefore, I am. Uh, so, and this was not, this was not common in this uh, age where, I mean, in the, you, were, you were just um, a part of God's plan. So, so to think about you as an individual was hugely revolutionary. Um, of that time. So, so you can see how this um, um, rise of the of ideas of reason, thinking, the individual, um, how that is also conflated with the rise of sciences that happened at approximately the same time, as well as, you know, we are in media and communication studies, we like to link um, changes in the um, in society with also changes in media and this is also when we see the uh, rise of the printing press I mean the printing press has been right um, been invented centuries earlier but it's now it's it's exploding in that sense the idea that you could actually print 
to a you, you I mean in medieval Europe you had um, a, a profession that was a copyist people just sitting and copying books by hand now with the printing press you didn't have to do this and you can also um, send uh, and uh, spread your ideas um, through the printing press and to a mass of people hence a mass society now if we then go to uh, late modernity um, We see in the second half of the 20th century how this, I mean, the rise of individualism that started with modernity um, kind of accelerate, accelerated um, but also changed into a focus of more um, self fulfillment that you should fulfill yourself, you should live your dreams, um, be true to who you are. And these ideas and this was not the least if we connect that to uh, to changes in the media system through the rise of radio television and advertisement I mean there are also those sociologists who claim that the whole idea of youth I mean which most of you belong to this category of youth something that is in between childhood and um, uh, adulthood um, was actually uh, did not exist before the radio and these ideas of, of having this transitional period where you listen to music, you explore your identity, etc. So um, um, the importance of the media we should not underestimate in these changes. So um, I'm sorry for the typo here, but media become important in how we viewed ourself, um, ourselves and others around us. And more so than the more traditional um, authorities of modernity, um, family, the church, um, class, uh, workers' union, um, and upbringing, etc. So media becomes more important here in, in how we understand who we are. Um, I mean, I can just given personal example of my grandfather who was born on a farm and he died on that farm so the idea that he could fulfill himself in that sense that he could become whatever he wanted go and study abroad not take over the farm and work the farm as his father has done um, was unthinkable perhaps it was starting to be thinkable at that time um, but now it's no one requests or it, it's not that your life is already um, predicted for you how you were born and in what circumstances you were born to the same extent anymore. Um, and here we could talk about uh, trends in this late modern time uh, in increasing medialization, uh, that media becomes even more and more important. We have more media, more channels on television. When I grew up in the 80s in Sweden, there was two channels on television, channel one and channel two. And that was it. Now, now there are so many channels that I don't even know how to count them. And with this medialization, uh, two very common trends that are being have been discussed thoroughly in social sciences and in media and communication studies as well is um, the uh, de decreasing importance of time and place. Time doesn't become so important when we have this mediated images and sound that we can um, take part of uh, um, whenever we want um, and whenever it suits us and as you can understand where I'm going with this with digital late modernity that this, this becomes even more accelerated uh, with the internet as, as the same as place I mean now we can do our um, bank errands online we can do applications online we don't have to go to the office once again, when I was young, I mean, you have to go, and the bank was closing at three o'clock, so you had to basically go during your lunch hours to get your bank errands done. Um, this is not the case anymore. Uh, we also see an increasing individualization. Um, um, that the idea that we are our own persons, that I am me, I am Jacob, and I'm a unique person. And, um, and I'm not determined by my family, where I was born, um, where I was brought up to the same extent. I have the possibility to explore what is me. 
And this can also, has also been said, has led to an increasing fragmentation of society and nichification because we want to be unique. Uh, we want to find our niches. Um, I mean, for example, I usually take the example of, of metal music. I mean, there are so many genres of metal music. It's death metal, it's heavy metal, it's grindcore. Um, there are so many different versions of this. Um, because you know there is, seems to with individualization coming this need to to nicheify ourselves, find our own niches, uh, which also leads to a fragmentation of society. And then something that we also come back to um, in lecture four here is reflexivity, uh, the reflecting of yourself and your life choices and how we are conceived. That we constantly think about ourselves. How am I? Like, wh what shall I put on when I meet you tomorrow? How I want you to think that I'm look. Cool, um, but I don't want to be like too youngish. Perhaps I'm becoming a pathetic person trying to look younger than I am. So this idea that we constantly think about um, how we are conceived by others, we reflect about this. So this increasing reflexivity um, is is uh, um, an example of of this. Um, and we'll talk more about this. In lecture four here, but um, and the idea that we look at ourselves through the eyes of the others. How will I be conceived by others? That's how I dress or how I dress up. The looking glass self, as George Herbert Cooley um, mentioned already in um, 1902. But we'll talk more about this later, so don't worry if you feel uh, lost there. So as I said, with the idea of digital late modernity, um, the idea that the rise of digital technology is intertwined with these uh, sociological or sociocultural changes in late modernity, it's happening in tandem. Um, and as I said, this is kind of an anti-deterministic uh, stance. Um, yeah, I'm trying to change the language here to Swedish so you don't get the... Um, red underline uh, to English, so you don't get the red underlines. But anyway, let's leave with that. Um, so this is happening in the same time. Computers and culture influence each other, and and, and this is not a revolutionary um, idea that I present to you. Manovich ma makes it clear in his book, um, as well as one uh, one very important scholar today, Andrew Finberg, uh, who is in Canada, in Vancouver, working there, the Simon Fraser University, who, by the way, uh, was um, uh, did his PhD for um, Herbert Marcuse, who in his in way did his PhD for Heidegger, so you can see direct lineage there. Anyway, um, so we cannot really understand technology and society apart here, and the article um, that Ulrike and I wrote on network media logic, you can really connect that also to the logic of late modern or post-industrial, post-Fordist uh, society in the sense that both value individuality over conformity. And uh, here I will also precede another um, concept that um, Sylvain we'll talk about uh, the network society, but I think it's important to just mention it here in order to grasp the idea of, of the digital late modernity, um, that the network society is basically, if we look at the Van Dijk definition, um, a social formation with an infrastructure of social and media networks enabling its prime mode of organization at all levels, individual, organizational, societal, and global. So the network is becoming the prime mode of organization at all this level. This is network society. And um, we are intertwined in all these networks and all levels. <clears throat> and perhaps the most important scholar here talking about the network society, even though Van Dyck is very critical of Castells as many others, uh, is Manuel Castells, of course. And he, I mean, his magnus opus, um, the network society in the beginning of the millennium, uh, which was a huge uh, 
it was very en vogue to uh, read and refer to uh, Castells at that time. Um, he sees the network as an intersectional concept for overcoming these boundaries between society and technology. So this is where I also want to link this to the idea of digital late modernity. So he sees a tendency to organize processes and functions of networks, uh, the networks becoming the social morphology, morpho morphology of society, influencing everything from processes of production to individual experiences, power and culture. And uh, this will also, we can also link to the culture of the database, which I will talk a little bit about later. So Castelsi mainly departs from two contemporary interlinked developments, increasing global interdependent economies and what he's referring to as the an information technology revolution, both steering capitalism towards increasing network cooperation. So he sees both the rise of internet basically and the increasing interdependence of economy as forwarding this network as the prime mode of organization in society. Um, so we see how here how digital communication systems become integrated in not only in economy and um, but also in the production and distribution of culture um, adapting its picture sounds and images to the faster shifting taste of individuals in late modernity as he writes in his second volume of his Magnus Opus the network society so culture also becomes um, influenced by by um, the network van Dyck building on this argues that networks becomes the nervous system of our society and it will influence everything including our social and personal life and we can think about how this is changing ourselves how we change um, how culture has changed and we will think about this a lot later in class um, so in digital late modernity the concept of networks becomes um, increasingly important here in order to understand um, how society is changing um, and how it inter accompanies interaction patterns as well as sociability and individualism which will lead me to the concept of network individualism in the next slide because most of us realize that we we i mean we are operating in all these different networks we are connected to partial communities and we deal with kin neighbors colleagues school friends, mates, you're all intertwined in all these little networks everywhere. Um, so this this implies um, that also you as individual, if we adopt a network um, analysis uh, terminology, you become a node in the network, like all these little dots that you see here uh, uh, in a typical network map this is a no you could the individual becomes a node in the network an increasingly important step in order to spread information for example or to connect with others um, so uh, therefore it can be argued that networks and individualization become increasingly intertwined um, um, but as well as it, it can be argued that they are in incompatible um, because you could claim that the network, a network is basically a collective and that would undermine the traditional idea of the individual as um, a sovereign subject. But, um, which I will argue very forcefully for, that individualism can also be considered a form of collective identity. I mean, Scott Lash has written forcefully about this in The Culture of Narcissism. Um, and this has also been theorized under this concept of network individualism that I will go to now. And it was first mentioned by Barry Wellman, uh, a Canadian as well, he's in Toronto right now, um, and been picked up by Castells notably, and has had a spread um, this concept. So I, I found this particularly illuminating for understanding what we do on social media basically, how we link ourselves to different collectives or different networks in today's society. And we can ask us why, why do we link up with all these people online? And the 
quick answer to that is that we want to be visible. We want to remain visible and we cannot be ourselves without having others who sees us, this looking glass self thing. And uh, yeah, Thompson wrote in his very famous book on media and modernity, he says that visibility and power is very tightly interconnected. And power and visibility, we will talk about in the next lecture, but um, the idea that we need to connect to others to be ourselves, I think, is um, and to be seen by others and to be uh, um, be someone. We have to be seen, we have to be connected. That's perhaps why you haven't turned off your mobile phones right now, because you want to be connected, you want to be part of this network, you want to be connected to others. Huh? Um, So we see then um, in uh, digital late modernity there is a shift from these tightly bounded communities of modernity um, but this doesn't mean that individuals are in opposition to others. On the contrary, we need others to be ourselves, as I just said. And I just put um, an example of myself here when I was interviewed in tele I was on the news um, when I worked in Karlstad and I posted this on uh, online and of course I wanted others to like it, to comment on it, because if I would post this and no one would like it, what would that say about myself and the image of myself? So we need others to be ourselves, basically. Other scholars have worked about this. Um, Vivian and Berg Berges, Jean Burgess in, in Australia has talked about uh, networked identity. Um, and they study queer digital storytelling and their conclusion there is that individual identities are deeply enmeshed with social identities. Um, so the idea that identities network is individual but it's social at the same time. And Nancy Baim has even talked, reversed the whole thing and talked about network collectivism instead of network individualism in or in f even further underlining their interconnections that you really cannot make this sharp distinction between collectivism and individualism. And Castells in his latest, well, in his second latest volume, uh, Communication Power from 2009, talks about the simultaneous rise of individualism and communalism as two opposing yet equally powerful cultural patterns that characterize the world. I mean, perhaps we could see it as, as um, um, the two sides of the same coin individualism and communalism or collectivism, as you so wish. Other, um, Sisi Papacherizzi and her um, doctoral student um, wrote also, underlined also how social media, on social media users can simultaneously ex express uniqueness and connection to others at the same time. And that these two practices are tightly intertwined since identity expression online are supported by comments by others. I mean, just imagine if I wouldn't get any comments or any likes when I posted a video of me on the news. I mean, that would be devastating for my identity and for my self-esteem, I think. I think. Anyway, um, and in a very um, um, popular um, article right now, um, Alexandra Segeberg at Political Science in, in Stockholm and Lance Bennett from University of Washington in Seattle uh, wrote in this highly cited article um, how you know it personalized themes and content which is often call, called memes um, uh, how they are shared via social media to trusted others and how this illustrates how the self is connected to others via digital networks today I mean they use the example of um, the Occupy movements and they have this um, meme such as we are the 99% and how this then spreads because we can um, personalize them, we can make them part of ourselves, and then we spread it to others. And this shows um, these easy personalized memes, we are the 99%, Pasalo, as it was in Spain, the Indignados, um, how, they, um, how the self and the others are increasingly intertwined because if no one would pass it on or uh, it wouldn't spread, uh, if we wouldn't connect these rather collective themes to our own person, it wouldn't work. So networking is an evident social need in an individual society, individualized society, through the process of identification 
uh, we link ourselves to others, to causes that provide our life with participation and life and participation with meaning. Um, I mean, you know, what do you link to on Facebook? Just think about that. Um, what are the causes you link to? I mean, I think it means that you want to tell something about yourself if you uh, link yourself to a popular band, for example. If you link yourself to Britney Spears or perhaps Lady Gaga, you want to say something about yourself here. Uh, people gain self-esteem and a sense of power, a sense of empowerment through being aware of uh, how they are perceived by others. So social media here giving us a control over our image and our identity to a much greater degree um, than before. So this leads me also into the second concept I want to quickly discuss here, and that is the culture of the database, which is uh, something that Manovich in his book phrased, and I think is also very useful to kind of tie up this tie it together the idea of the network individualism uh, together with it, um, the society where we live. So life today can be seen as living in the ultimate archive or the ultimate database is what Manovich argues and which Miller also takes up being highly influential, influenced by Manovich in his book as well as does. Um, and, and these ideas are very old. Um, Vannevar Bush, for example, he wrote already in 1945, an American yeah, visionary, we could say, um, of the memex, a kind of machine that would free man from mechanical work. I mean, and we would later get the computer um, or the calculator and things like that. And later, highly influential as well, um, the French uh, philosopher Pierre Lévy, uh, who wrote about this collective intelligence that together uh, we become smarter than we are um, um, alone or just adding our, our I mean just think of something like Wikipedia or these collect crowdsourcing things is based on this idea of collective intelligence so uh, the imaginary of the internet or how the internet has imagined and ideas that build upon builds upon these ideas of, of databases and archives and uh, Jana Dös writes about this as well. Internet is a pi public library of almost everything, embodying personalized experience of all the information of the universe. And this is the ultimate idea that we have all the knowledge just click away, search searchable. Um, so the storage of digitalized content in databases of all types and its accessibility by software program is a pivotal component of all interactive media. Um, and, and from this idea that you know we, we have to store uh, and retrieve content in databases um, m might be from this idea we might understand this kind of urge to manage our friends and linkages on social media platform uh, these weak ties that we might be um, able to use in the future and Mano Manovich claims that it points towards the shift from the narrative as a key form of cultural expression to the database in our digital late modern age. Now, I mean, the narrative being that we have a beginning, um, a middle, and an end. Now, with the database, we don't have that. It's, it's constantly, we can rewrite. Think about the var variability principle we talked about. Um, everything can be changed. We can search the database for more. So this is changing. Um, new media technologies, according to him, do not tell stories. They have no beginning or no end, as I just said. No development thematically or otherwise that could organize them into sequences. Uh, databases are always in progress and thus the management of them can never be finalized or transformed into traditional narratives. The databases are never finished. You can still collect friends. You can still make contacts that you might need to use in the future. Just think of something like uh, LinkedIn, for example. Um, this um, um, That in Sweden is the most popular social media platform for connecting work contacts and in some areas it's very important to get a job for example. Um, so after the end of the grand narratives and the arrival of the web um, uh, the world appears to us as an endless and unstructured collection of images, text and other data records according to Manevich and this we have to sort into 
to databases. So the problem at the end of the 20th century then, according to um, this idea, is no, not longer to, to, uh, to how to create new media objects here, but how to find an object or content or knowledge that already exists somewhere. Um, so the idea of finding information instead of um, creating information in the sense uh, becomes more important. Uh, and this has then led to these technologies to store, organize and efficiently access these materials. Now, um, I can just share you a short story of my, my brother who's, who's teaching in, uh, um, um, in college uh, where he there was this student um, who, who, who during a, a math examination managed to find um, the answer to the question um, asked uh, during like a two second when the teacher turned away he brought up his mobile phone checked tried to find the answer because he didn't know and um, he f and then he eventually he got caught um, and was then led to disciplinary actions however it could be argued that being able to find the right answer to a difficult mathematical problem within a couple of seconds is exactly the kind of skills that will become increasingly important in this digital late modernity which is based on culture of a database. So maybe we have to reconsider our um, conception of knowledge. Computer databases become a metaphor to conceptualize individual lives and collective memory. Um, Mark does talk about life caching, how we you know, store our lives and our memories in our timelines and um, online on Facebook, for example. And he says that this leads to or contributes to a shared spatial memory, a collective repository of our knowledge of the world. So databases has thus become the way to represent human experience, the world and human existence uh, in it. So this is about the very shortly on digital late modernity, two major themes there, um, networked individualism and the culture of the database. Now, um, we are also expected to um, have a research-based uh, education here at Uppsala University. So I want to share with you my latest thoughts and thinking on on digital late modernity and this whole concept that I, together with Oriol, has developed in this essay, which I'm particularly interested to discuss with you. Since this is a um, work in progress, um, I am really look forward to discuss these ideas with you. Now, you have the essay to read um, just very shortly here before ending. Um, what we do here in this essay is is kind of criticizing ourselves. Well, I'm criticizing myself because I've been using the concept of digital late modernity. But the idea of this criticism is that maybe this whole idea of modernity and trying to stretch it and talk about late modernity or post-modernity, maybe the whole idea of modernity has become so broad that it doesn't mean anything. Maybe we need another term to um, discuss um, the time we're in today and this is what we we then propose as being a global age and two major things is important for this global age um, we think the two major characteristics interdependence that everything becomes connected to everything else in these networks you could say um, and also accompanying this is opacity that we cannot fully grasp or understand these interdependencies and hence we cannot predict the future so, so this awareness of interdependence without fully grasping its inner working, we argue, leads to an ex anxiety and perhaps even reflexivity. One of the major characteristics of late modern uh, theorizing becomes in crisis here. Because we, we, yes, we are able to reflect and become whoever we are, but at the same time we have seen the consequences of, of this. Um, endless consumerism and the destroying of the planet and we know that it's interlinked in some way we're interdependent with this climate change in some way but we don't really know how so we think this leads to some kind of anxiety and perhaps even that the whole idea of reflexivity becomes in crisis and 
these ideas we develop um, by three just shortly attending to three different aspects environment economy and the internet and then we end this very short essay um, on a reflection uh, of this global age from the very famous mural painting from Diego Rivera man the controller of the universe as you see in the slide here now this would be for you to read in the article and I do look forward to uh, to discuss with you and with this um, thank you very much and I see you Thursday